last lecturer this afternoon is Dr. Roger Garrison. He's going to be speaking to us about the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Roger? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I use the title, the same thing was on the program, the Austrian theory of the business cycle. But I like to point out that the uh, graphical apparatus that I'm going to present uh, is actually much more broad than that. And uh, I could easily change the title. I didn't change it. I obliterated it. To capital-based macroeconomics. That's, that's what I've been calling it lately. And that term has caught on uh, to some extent. But if you look at my book, Time and Money, you'll see there's only a couple of chapters devoted to expositing the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And other chapters use that same apparatus to deal with deficit spending, spending on infrastructure, uh, credit control. In fact, I'll show you how that works even in this lecture. And even tax reform. I've got one uh, section of a chapter that shows using this apparatus uh, what would happen if uh, we were to reform in the direction of a consumption tax instead of an income tax. So the apparatus is very versatile. Uh, although the main application, I think, if only because this is what the old Austrian economists have stressed, uh, is the business cycle lecture. Uh, I subtitle it Sustainable and Unsustainable Growth, Macroeconomics of Boom and Bust, and uh, that's a tip-off from the very beginning, that uh, a business cycle is simply unsustainable growth. And it turns out the reason it's unsustainable is because it's fueled by uh, created credit uh, as opposed to being supported by voluntary savings. So I don't want to save my punchline to the end. That's it. You know, that's what you're looking for. But if you know what you're looking for, then you're more likely to see uh, how it all plays out. Uh, I have one slide here where I just lay out the particular uh, pieces of graphic that uh, make up the, the uh, model that I'm going to show. And th th one point is that they're mostly uh, off-the-shelf models. And, and one of my purposes was to exposit this business cycle theory in a way that uh, neoclassicals could understand and maybe even... Keynesians, I don't know, okay, but that, that was what I was trying for. So production possibilities frontier is something you see in chapter one of virtually every principles text on the market. And loanable funds uh, theory is something you see in most of them, and the supply and demand for loans, uh, which gives you an equilibrium interest rate. Uh, the structure of production is the one unique to the Austrian school. We talked about that yesterday when I did uh, capital theory, so I can be brief about that today, although it will be included in this presentation. That's the Hayekian view of uh, the sequence of stages of production. And uh, stage-specific labor markets. Well, we know what the labor markets look like is supply and demand for labor. And you see that in the Keynesian theory, although that market doesn't function very well. And you see it in other theories. But uh, the unique thing about the Austrians is uh, to understand the business cycle, you can't just look at the labor market. You have to look at how that market works at different stages of production because it works differently depending on changes in the interest rate, it turns out. Uh, then the application here is simply uh, sustainable growth. We show uh, how the economy can grow uh, without any uh, reversion to trend. In other words, it doesn't uh, go bust. Uh, and on the other hand, how uh, unsustainable growth, uh, in fact, gives you uh, a bust. One is based on saving, the other one on credit uh, creation. Um, I show the two principles here. Uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, set out this theory near the end of his theory of money and credit in 1912, so it's 100 years old, uh, just in a few pages, very few pages, that he allocated it at the end of that book. But uh, it was all there, pretty much, uh, the theory. Uh, Hayek's contribution was to make it uh, pedagogically sound and to uh, embellish on the theme that uh, was set out by 
uh, Mises. And so he did that in the uh, late 20s and 30s, did battle with Keynes, as we'll see in tomorrow's lecture. So this is where most of the stuff comes from as far as the theory goes. I want to add one methodological point, which is critical, I think, to understand the difference between the Austrians and Keynes or the Austrians and most of the other business cycle theories, including uh, Milton Friedman's own theories about uh, cyclical movements in the economy. It's a methodological point. I'm paraphrasing Hayek here. Uh, and I think there was a statement that commands assent just upon hearing it, okay? And what he says is that before we can even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right, right? Sound reasonable to you? I think so. But the Austrians are unique in that respect when it comes to business cycle theory. Uh, Keynes, for instance, didn't raise the issue at all about how things could go right because he thought they couldn't. He thought that was the problem. There's, a, there's nothing in, in the nature of a market system that would cause things to go right. And that's why they always go wrong. And then he had particulars about just how uh, it does go wrong. But uh, even monetarists or, the, or other business cycle theorists don't bother with this uh, methodological nicety. Uh, now, what I'll warn you about or to uh, uh, prepare you for is that even though this lecture is about the business cycle, most of it will be answering that first question of how things can go right to show how the market works to allocate resources intertemporally and in accordance with people's preferences for consumption now as opposed to later, uh, which is to say their preferences in terms of saving as opposed to consuming. Uh, and then once we get through that, we got that down, then the business cycle theory is, is just a corollary. In other words, if that market mechanism is interfered with, well, things don't go right. They go wrong, and they go wrong in the particular way that's spelled out by the Austrian theory of the business cycle. So again, I'm sort of preparing you what, for what's coming. I start out with uh, familiar production possibilities front here, again on page somewhere between page 5 and 10 of every macroeconomic or economics a textbook is used in micro really predominantly rather than macro. I put up my graphic here, uh, consumption on the vertical axis, investment on the horizontal axis, and uh, recognize that I say under favorable conditions, a fully employed economy uh, allocates resources to both uses, that is consumption and investment, making the most of the trade-off. Now, under favorable conditions, well, I mean the market is allowed to work. Wage rates change to clear the labor market. Interest rates change to clear the market for loans. Prices change to clear the supply and demand for goods and services. Those are the favorable conditions. And if that's so, then the economy is going to find itself somewhere on that uh, production possibility uh, frontier. And there it is. Uh, okay. I just mentioned here that... Uh, it's a familiar diagram, but you see it in every context except for the macro theory. You don't see it in macro theory, uh, either by Keynes or by the neoclassicals, by the monetarists. You just don't see it. But what it's used for is to illustrate the concept of scarcity. You have to give up one thing to get another. Or uh, to show something about capital and interest, and you'll see uh, that kind of a trade-off, or you see... Uh, trade-off in terms of military and civilian spending, Samuelson's favorite use of it, guns and butter. One thing has to be traded off uh, for another. You see it sometimes in, in the context of economic growth, but rarely does it appear in a macroeconomic uh, piece of analysis. Here it, here it will, as you'll see. Okay. Uh, one of the things that the, the trade-off emphasizes is sort of a bedrock difference between the Austrian theory and the Keynesian theory. Here I'm putting consumption and investment on separate axes, showing that one's a trade-off against the other. In Keynes, they're added together as just two 
of the forms of spending. He's more interested in just total spending, which as you know has three forms, isn't that right? C plus I plus G, cons consumption plus investment plus government spending. Just add them all up and call it spending and go on from there. Uh, okay, so we're gonna trade one off against the other. Uh, now, before I go further, let me mention this uh, about the PPF. The PPF, even in the standard textbooks, uh, takes that frontier to correspond to a, quote, fully employed economy, right? It's fully employed economy. So if the economy is suffering from cyclical uh, recession, then uh, you're inside the frontier, yeah, sure. But full employment doesn't mean 100%, does it? It means there's about 100% employment, doesn't mean that. It means about 95%. In other words, there's 5% unemployment, even in a healthy economy, which gives some scope for moving beyond the frontier, right? Uh, because policies can drive the unemployment rate down to 4% or even below, and has in recent years, right? And if, if the unemployment rate is driven down by some perverse policy, we're outside the frontier. Now, only temporarily it can't stay there, it's unsustainable, that's the whole idea. But it is possible to move outside the frontier if the frontier is defined as, not only I define it, but as the textbooks define it, as fully employed economy. Okay, we'll see how that comes into play later. Uh, and here I'm showing that uh, that horizontal distance there is gross investment by gross, I mean it's both uh, making good on depreciation and wear and tear and so on, obsolescence and so on. Uh, and I mentioned that out there. Typically, in the investment needed just to replace worn out obsolete capital and so on, something less than the total. Uh, and so possibly replacement capital is some magnitude like that. This is an economy that uh, has some positive net investment, as you see. In fact, the net investment uh, in this diagram would be that difference between gross investment uh, and the uh, smaller amount needed for capital replacement, right? Now, positive net investment just means that the economy would be growing. In other words, next year uh, we'll have more resources, more to work with, and the frontier itself will shift outwards from year to year precisely because there's net investment uh, going on, all right? So the outward shift of the PPF then represents sustained economic growth because you really have that extra investment uh, that you can beef up the productive capacity of the economy with, all right? So I say watch the economy grow. Now we can see it grow. Should be able to hear it grow, but I haven't heard it yet. But the economy grows, okay? Uh, perfectly sustainable. Four periods of growth are shown here, and you get more consumption, more investment, because the market is at work allocating resources to one or the other in accordance with people's preferences, okay? And I go a little uh, digression here, I'm gonna virtually skip over. Uh, the rate of expansion depends on a lot of things. Uh, capital depreciation changes too, and maybe more significantly, uh, when people uh, earn more income because of the growing economy, their saving preferences can change. Typically, the more wealthy you are, the more able and willing you are to save. And so saving may increase more than in proportion to Income. I'm not showing that here in the diagram, but that certainly can happen. Now, importantly, it says, I should probably italicize importantly because show you just how important it is. A change in saving preferences, underline it too, okay? Change in saving preferences, which provokes a movement along the PPF, affects the rate at which the PPF expands. So it's possible for people to change their preferences. And if they do and the markets are working, then the economy will move along the frontier. Suppose they decide to save more, okay? Uh, that's what that says there. They become more thrifty, they more future-oriented. They reduce their current consumption and save instead. What happens? 
Well, it says, watch the economy move along the frontier. Let's see if it does it. There it goes, okay? <laughs> Moves along the frontier. And it looks pretty amazing. It's a miracle, right? Uh, and that happens only in the Austrian school. This is what's amazing. It, it doesn't happen in the monetarist school because the monetarists lump those two things together, consumption and investment. It's just called Q, output. And the Keynesians deny uh, that it can move along the frontier. In fact, if, if saving occurs, the economy collapses. Don Prince was reminding me uh, yesterday that there's a famous diagram in Samuelson's text that showed the economy a diagram with a plumbing diagram. Have you seen it? A plumbing diagram. And at the bottom of the diagram is a drain. An arrow sticks out of the drain is labeled saving. <laughs> okay. The saving drains out of the economy. And at the top of the diagram is an intake for some exogenous force to pour more money into the system. Who do you think that is? <laughs> okay. So it's odd to see a theory where we can move along the production possibilities frontier, especially when you realize that second P stands for possibilities. So if you can't move along the production possibilities frontier, it should be called a PIF, okay? Production impossibilities frontier. You have to stay where you are, probably inside it, okay? So that's the story there. Uh, so now the economy grows at a faster rate. Well, of course, because the savings have, has beefed up, it's like a turbocharger, it's beefed up uh, the amount of investment and the economy can grow faster. Let's see if we can get that going. Watch the economy grow down. There it goes. Hey, we got sound. Thing. We got sound. Thanks, Chad. I think that's Chad's sound. I think he's doing that himself. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so increased thriftiness makes a difference. Uh, you can see, well here, let's just compare uh, the two diagrams. I'll put my old one over there and uh, compare them. Look at the diagrams themselves and look at the left one. Uh, you've got the economy growing, not so fast, but it's growing. And the other one, you've got the economy first saving, like that, and then growing faster, like so, okay? Uh, that's how the economy works, as people uh, choose to save. That's really just, that's what the PPF is all about. And I can get that far just by understanding what the PPF actually means. So starting with the four periods here, what I'm showing is that the savers actually are consuming more now. Even though they had to cut back at first, they're consuming more now than they would have been had they not saved in the first place. That's what saving is all about. That's why your parents are telling you about saving. Okay, okay. market for loanable funds. This is the other, another element. Rate of interest on the vertical axis, saving and investment, if some of you can't see it on the horizontal axis. And essentially, this is an application of supply and demand to the market for loans. It's, uh, it's an Alfred Marshall. He's Mr. Micro. So saving constitutes the supply of loanable funds. You save, you put your money at interest, and that's available for lending. And guess what? The higher interest rates you can get, the more likely you are to save. It slopes upward like most savings most uh, supply curves. Demand reflects a business community's willingness to borrow and undertake investment projects. That's the demand that slopes downward, as you would expect. That demand for loanable funds is the business demand, and it's what Mises refers to as the entrepreneurial component of this market. In other words, business people want to borrow these monies because they think they know about a project they can undertake and make a greater return than what they have to pay uh, interest. All right. Uh, so straightforwardly, supply and demand looks like that. All right. And it's, it's significant that this, or this uh, market is very broadly conceived. It's, it's not just the supply and demand for bank loans. 
is the supply and demand generally for investable funds. In other words, any, any uh, way that savings of the individual income earner is put in the hands of investors through financial markets, that constitutes the supply and then the demand for uh, loanable funds. And so I label that down there, it might be too low for some of you to see, but I call it investable resources. And, and both Maynard Keynes and Bon Bavaric, the Austrian and the Keynesian, understood the market in that way. And that's the way Dennis Robertson intended it, by the way, it's a macro uh, concept. So that's the investable resources. All right, I think I have a little hat tip to Dennis Robertson here. Yeah, it was Dennis Robertson. If you haven't seen him before, that's Sam, you'll recognize him. Now, here's, here's something to think about. This diagram, and this diagram alone, appears in the general theory. It's, it's the only diagram in the general theory. And he put it in there at Roy Harrod's suggestion. Roy Harrod wrote the, read the manuscript, and... He told Keynes, he said, gee, Maynard, it looks like you're throwing out the loanable funds theory. And, and Maynard says, yeah, that's it, out. And, and Herod says, I'm not sure exactly how the conversation went, but this is, and Herod, <laughs> and Herod says, well, if that's what you're doing, you better make that clear to your reader because they, other, otherwise they won't believe you. And Keynes took the advice, so he put the diagram in and threw it out, okay? So it appears on page 180, I think I say that in here somewhere. Yeah, 180, okay, so it's the only diagram that appears. Okay, the, the Austrians, bless their hearts, they tend not to use diagrams. I mean, it's an outlier when Hayek drew the triangle. Uh, but they, they argue in terms of loanable funds. So if people become more future-oriented, once again, like we said before, that means they save more. So that savings curve shifts to the right, okay? Uh, watch the saving curve shift rightward. You think you can do it? There it goes, okay? And when they do, it, it reduces interest rates, and it offers up more savings for investors to invest, and investors borrow it, more so than before, because it's cheaper, right? And they can think of projects that have a yield that's somewhere between those two horizontal dotted lines that they couldn't undertake before, but they can now. It's all pretty simple, all right? Uh, let's see where we're gonna go from here. So we see the interest rate falls and uh, the amount of loanable funds available increases. With a given technology, saving and investment are prerequisite to genuine, sustainable growth. See, that does free up the resource. Think what it means to save. You know, people go to work and they produce things, they get paid for it, it's called income. Some of which they consume, the rest they save. So whatever they save, it means that, the, that some of their output is available for the business community to use, right? And the business community takes command of that unconsumed resources by borrowing the saving from the income earners and buying the resources that are not consumed uh, to increase the productive capacity of the economy. All right? Now, those two curves tell the same story just from different perspectives. So let's put them both on the screen at once and show that they're linked by that, uh, those investable resources, like so, okay? Uh, and so the, the stories I've been, two stories I've told can be told uh, all at once. Now I say watch the saving induced decrease in the interest rate and the corresponding movements of the PPF. What you have to do now is sort of turn your head sideways so you have one eye looking at the top diagram and the other eye looking at the bottom. But the same thing happens as before, except that it's very, very coordinated. You see how that increased investment then uh, gets uh, 
depicted also as a movement along the PPF, as does the increased saving, because increased saving means decreased consumption. Okay, so we got a coherent story. It's internally consistent. It's very sustainable. And that just says the market is at work for you and for me there. Uh, notice that uh, you have more investment and less current consumption. And with current there, again, should be italicized, less current consumption. Now, an interesting thing to ponder is that in Keynesian analysis, this was just not possible. This, this just couldn't happen. In fact, what he argued uh, is that according to Keynes, I mean, drop down there, the reduction in consumer spending would result in excess inventories. Well, it would. If you're not spending as much, you're not, you're not buying things from Walmart or Target or whatever. You have excess inventories, and then uh, you have reduced spending by Walmart and getting more inventories, right? Uh, but Keynes assumed that's what happens all through the economy. Okay, so if people quit spending then spending triple, rick, ripples through the system and all spending goes down. And instead of moving along the frontier, you move inside the frontier, right? And that's what he calls, you can't, on the bottom there, the Keynes' paradox of thrift. Paradoxically, if you save, cut back spending, the economy goes into recession. Well, he hasn't got uh, wages, interest rates, and prices adjusting uh, to the new preferences, and therefore he gets a malfunction and you move inside the frontier. Okay. So Keynes would be right if he's talking about the inventories at retail, if he's talking about late stage operations. But it turns out that early stage operations is affected dominantly by that low interest rate. Interest rate effect dominates long-term or early stage investment, okay, while the cutback in expenditure dominates in the early. But that's exactly what you want. You want to cut down on production for current consumption, and you want to increase long-term projects, which will have goods ready for consumers when they've saved up to buy something, okay? In fact, in class, I like to use Instead of just saving, I like to use saving up for something. People don't save for fun. It's not fun, okay? They save up for something. S-U-F-S, although I don't, I don't keep carrying that uh, label. But save up for something. And it's the entrepreneur's job to figure out what is going to sell in this future market with which people have increased savings that they can spend, Okay. And the best of the entrepreneurs will make the biggest profits and so on. It's a story can be told many times uh, in a market economy. So to keep track of these changes, we have to have that production or that uh, structure of production. That's what I talked about yesterday. So I won't spend quite so much time on it, but except to remind you what it's all about. The structure of production, and by structure of production, one phrase I neglected yesterday, I'll, I'll introduce now, is that capital can be seen as simply the produced means of production, which is to say plant and equipment, tools, machinery, and that sort of thing, that are arrayed temporally in stages. And uh, we show the stages here, like we did yesterday, like so. And we depict it just with photos, saying that there's some early stages product development, and late stages, inventory management. Uh, and we recognize that uh, goods in process move through the stages of production, starting at the early stages and merging at the late stages, uh, in a temporal succession. And I try to show that. I've got some sound, but not much. It goes like that. I've uh, eliminated the Model A's. You don't need to see, need to see that again. Uh, and together, the stages form this Hayekian triangle. So I just make, I simplify it and make it a Hayekian triangle. Uh, and now, 
I'm showing that uh, with secular growth, like we showed with the PPF, uh, the economy can grow, but this time I'm showing it with the PPF, okay? Because that consumption measured as a horizontal distance, I'm sorry, the vertical distance on the PPF is also the output of the last stage of the Hayekian triangle. And so uh, let's watch now the PPF and the structure of production expand together, not because there's been any increase in saving, but just because there's net investment. There's ongoing net investment, okay? And so you get that increase that looks like this. Same with the PPF before, and now the triangle is also expanding uh, at a sustainable rate because we've got net investment. When people save more, though, they send two seemingly, again in italics, seemingly contradictory signals. You have a decrease in consumption that dampens uh, demand in the late stages. Uh, that's the derived demand effect. But then reduced interest rate, that means it cuts costs, namely borrowing costs, in the early stages and encourages more of it, okay? Uh, the reason I say seemingly, because the contradiction is true only in a Keynesian framework where you have C plus I plus G. Which way does I go? You've got two forces. Uh, one is, is the derived demand effect pushing down. The other is the interest rate effect pushing up. Which way does it go? You might think it doesn't go anywhere. Or Keynes sort of looks out the window and sees a Great Depression going on and says, well, I, <laughs> I guess it goes down. So derived demand uh, dominates as far as Keynes is concerned. Uh, but in capital-based macro, they're not really conflicting signals, they're coordinating signals because they're working at different spots in that structure of production. So once again, as for emphasis, it's just the same thing. Watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. And here you see resources leaving the late stages and going to the early stages. It looks like that. That's the structure of production that will be more consistent with people's new preferences, which involve more saving, less consumption. And once again, we can show this using both of those diagrams. And uh, what we see is that they tell the same story Increased saving then has an effect, it turns out, both on the magnitude of the investment aggregate and the temporal pattern of the capital creation. So we're going to watch again now, watch the economy respond to an increased saving. So you get a movement along the frontier and you get more investment. Uh, there's our more investment. But look at the Hayekian triangle, you get a differential in terms of investment. You get less investment in the late stages, more investment in the early stages, but more net investment, okay? That's the way it works. It's a coordinating uh, operation and not one that uh, uh, is internally uh, contradictory. Now, Mises... When he discussed this, he called it malinvestment uh, when it was in the business cycles. We haven't really got to that yet, so maybe I'll hold off on that point until we get to the actual business cycle. Uh, so the, the structure of production is given more of a future orientation, which is consistent with the saving that made the restructuring possible. That is, people are saving now in order to increase their future spending power, okay, in the structure changes accordingly. This is market at work for you and, to, and for me again. Now see so that the economy grows more rapidly as before. We're just showing them both together. Okay, now here's something fun to do. Uh, I don't have time on an axis, but I brought in this little supplementary diagram that has consumption on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And if you look at, uh, let's say, the PPF, and their 
consumptions on the vertical axis. And so first it goes down, then up. Watch it. Down, then up. If you look at the triangles, can you see it? Can you see the original structure production that's had a little more consumption? And then, so it goes down again, then up. Watch that. Okay, so that's telling the same story. Now if we just graph it uh, against time, it looks like this. It goes down like that, then up, but at a greater rate because you got more growth, all right? It goes more rapidly than before and eventually overtakes where the economy would have been had there been no increase in savings. Now, the way you understand this is this saving implies giving up some consumption in the near future, and let's cross-hatch that, you can see what is given up in the near future, because you decided to save, you're not spending. And you do that because you know that you can gain even more in the more distant future. Right? So again, everything sort of hangs together. Once you get these graphics going, they tell the story almost almost on their own. All right. Now, stage-specific markets, I want to pick up the pace just a little bit. And here, I'm just recognizing that the labor market works differently in different stages. I don't have room for five labor markets, but I'll put two up there, and they are uh, early stage and late stage, uh, as you can guess. And so there's the early stage, there's the late stage, and those are really the two I've had up before, except before I just had photos of the guy in the, in the development lab and the guy at retail. Here I've got supply and demand for those sorts of services, right? And the, and the reason we need two, actually one for each stage, is those labor markets are characterized by differential interest rate sensitivities. In other words, uh, the, a change in the interest rate will affect one market one way and the other market the other way. So when Keynes talks about the interest rate and the interest rate being, I'm sorry, the wage rate and the wage rate being stuck and all that, he's missing the boat. This is one of Hayek's point. That no, no, it's not the wage rates, it's the pattern of wage rates. The pattern needs to change. Relative prices need to change, right? And so we can see how they need to change. An increase in saving has differential effects on the demand for labor in the early and late stages. Yeah, lower demand for labor in the early stages, or late stages, higher demand in the early stages. Let's watch that. Okay, watch the economy respond to an increase in saving again. You know what the triangle is going to do, so watch the labor markets. And you see uh, the demand decrease in the late stages because Target doesn't need as many stock people. And it increases in the early stages because more investments, long-term investments are being undertaken because of the low interest rate, all right? And once I got this far with the diagrams, I realized that there's a wage rate gradient there that Hayek mentions in Prices and Production. It's a diagram in a footnote of the second edition of Prices and Production. And you can see it there. I'm just noticing that wage rate is higher in the early stages, lower in the late stages. That's what caused labor to move out of early into low stages. All right, And that's what Hayek calls the wage rate gradient. That, that, remain, that maintains that upward trend until the economy has fully adjusted to this new level of saving. And then the wage rates will equalize again after the, so much labor has moved. Okay. All right, well, there's all of the different uh, graphics, loanable funds market, production possibilities, frontier, structure production, stage-specific labor markets, and you see how they're all tied together. Now we'll see them all at once uh, for the first time. It looks like that. And now we can see all at once what happens when people decide to save more. You can look around the diagrams and know exactly how things are going to work, 
and they're going to work in a coordinated way. I'll pull the trigger, I'll do it twice. Here's the first one. Okay, watch. Okay, savings, increases, moving along the frontier, reshaping the structure of production, wage rate gradient. I'm going to do it again. Okay. That's the way it works. Now, now, we've got to the end of the first part of the lecture. In other words, I've shown you how things can work right if markets are allowed to work. And now it's just a corollary to show that a business cycle occurs when markets are interfered with by policy, namely in artificially lowering interest rates. And I start, I'm trying to give myself some credibility here, and I've never been able to look that stern. I've tried, but that's, that's as stern as it gets, okay? And this is Steve Hankey uh, at Johns Hopkins. And look what he says. He says, with interest rates artificially low, he's not talking about an increase in savings, he's talking about Federal Reserve lowering interest rates. Consumers reduce saving, yeah, because they're not getting as much interest and, the, and they haven't shifted the supply curve. They're just not getting as much interest. They reduce saving in favor of consumption and entrepreneurs increase the rate of investment spending so that now we've got discoordination already. And then you have an imbalance between saving and investment. You have an economy on an unsustainable growth path. This in a nutshell is a lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 1920s and 30s. And notice he wrote this in May of 2008 and published it in Forbes. Uh, nobody read it, I think, but he, that's what he did. <laughs> All right, this is, this is uh, Hayek, and I put this in here because some critics of Hayek said, oh, well, Hayek changed his mind in his later years. Well, he didn't really, because this is a quote from 78, which might have been one of the last things he had to say about business cycle theory. It comes from an interview, so it's transcription of something delivered orally, so it's not quite as smooth writing as you would expect. But let's read through. He says, booms have always appeared with a great increase in investment, a large part of which proved to be erroneous, mistaken. Yeah, because nobody was saving more. That, of course, suggests a supply of capital that was made apparent, which wasn't actually existing. In other words, the market signal says there's more resources available to invest. There really wasn't. There were less because people were consuming more with those low interest rates, okay? So the whole combination of a stimulus to invest on a large scale followed by a period of acute scarcity of capital when it comes to light that you can't finish all these projects has been misdirection due to monetary influences. He says, in that general schema, I still believe is correct. And that was in 78, so he didn't change his mind. Now we get to the credit expansion, which I only have 15 minutes, but that's all I need, okay? I'm not worried, I'm not worried. We got credit expansion. So now instead of savings, you have an increase in the money supply. And of course, money comes through credit markets. New money comes through credit markets. So it shifts the supply of credit without increasing saving. In fact, it decreases saving, as we'll see. And this is, uh, here it says money masquerades as saving. Okay, the supply of loan will fund shifts to the right, but without there being any increase in saving. Watch the opposing movements of saving and investment as the central bank adds to the money supply, that will be delta M, okay? Now, I just want you to get it that this is a totally, totally different sort of story. Uh, because <laughs> <laughs> it involves a central banker, a policy maker, okay? And he's there thinking that interest rates ought to be lower for some reason or other, Pro probably because uh, he's trying to help Bill Clinton get reelected. Okay, uh, and so he increases the supply of credit. It's S plus delta M, it's not S prime. And now you can see the new equilibrium, it's not really an equilibrium, it's a double disequilibrium. You've got, you've got investors wanting to invest more while savers are saving less. And they're saving less because the old supply curve, the old savings curve is still applicable 
And at lower interest rates, they don't want to save as much. Might as well spend. I mean, you can feel that right now in this economy. If interest rates are 0.07 or whatever it is, you just soon, you just soon spend, okay? Uh, okay, responding to lower interest rate, people actually save more and they consume. <laughs> Results not a sustainable equilibrium, but rather a disequilibrium that for a time is masked by the infusion of loanable funds. Now here's where, uh, in, in Time and Money, I show what would happen if uh, Congress, instead of, instead of Greenspan, uh, will, will have Congress, passes a law, a uniform, cross-the-board, economy-wide ceiling on interest rates. Okay? Uh, and, and, and that would be that would be illustrated by that lower horizontal line, interest rates lower than... Now, if they did that, and if they could enforce it, it'd be very difficult to enforce, but if they did that and could enforce it, then of course it would immediately generate a huge credit crunch, a huge credit shortage, and the economy would drop like a rock right then, okay? If you, if you interfere with credit markets that boldly, then the economy is going to go down and go down fast. Okay, boy, we wouldn't want that. How about just papering over that shortage with money created for the purpose? You see, the only difference between the credit control and the credit expansion is the time element. In other words, with monetary expansion, it's like a it's like a credit control, but papering over the shortage with new money created for the purpose. Okay, in which case you don't get an immediate downturn, you get in, instead a boom. But it just means later on you'll get a big downturn, all right, because it's not sustainable. And I show here, I'll probably uh, lecture a little ahead of my graphics, but here I've shown that uh, investors are moving down along their demand curves and savers are moving down along their savings curve, and then the difference is precisely the delta M. That's, that's the horizontal distance between the shifted curve and the unshifted curve. So that delta M is the papering over of what otherwise would just be a credit control, right? So in time and money, I show that a credit control will foil the market immediately. Uh, monetary expansion will ignite a boom, which eventually uh, will lead to a bust, okay? Here is just saying that uh, much of Hayek's monetary writings direct attention away from the quantity theory conclusion that increasing the money supply causes prices to increase. Yeah, it does. We all know that. But his attention was to the distortion of credit markets and how that affects the economy, as can be shown by that loanable funds market. Now look what happens upstairs here. You have to trace up uh, from both uh, hollow points there. The consumers are, I'm sorry, the investors are trying to invest more because they've got cheap credit, okay? But the consumers are trying to consume more. They don't want to save because interest rates are so low, okay? And what we see is that Consumers are trying to push up, investors are trying to push to the right, and the resultant of that of those vectors are pushing beyond the PPF uh, to some I call it a virtual equilibrium. Okay, where you're not you're not going to achieve it because it's outside the PPF. You you can lunge towards it, but you're going to be thrown back <laughs> with the bust. Okay, uh, so that's the story there. Now, let's look at it in terms of the PPF. Again, now you have conflicting signals, right? You've got uh, the low interest rate is actually causing long-term projects to be initiated. Not that they can be completed, they can't, okay? But the, they're initiated, and so the upper tiers of that, those production processes are dotted lines. But some resources are allocated towards consumption because there's an increased demand for consumer goods. And 
those resources have to be have to come from somewhere in that production process that sort of gut the middle of it or something. Richard Striegel, whose name you might not be totally familiar with, uh, has a book out or had a book out that clear back at that time. Anybody remember the name of that book? Is something about Capital in Production. Thank you. Uh, and in Capital in Production, he actually he actually explained it this way. And, and said that the triangle is essentially pulled, both ends are pulled against the middle, okay? Uh, and I, in one sense, I was glad to find that, that reference. Uh, another sense, I wasn't, because, I, because that's what my diagrams had said already, and I thought, well, gee, this doesn't seem to be quite consistent with Hayek or Mises, uh, and yet, it's in Striegel. So I thought I, I thought I was original in that sense, but I wasn't. It was great. It was un, it's what they call unnecessary originality. Okay. <laughs> it was already in Striegel and it's in Machlup. Machlup explains this too. Okay. So it works that way. All right. So uh, the dynamics of boom and bust then entail both overinvestment and malinvestment. Mises emphasized the malinvestment almost to the point of saying there is no overinvestment. And the illustration he used to show no overinvestment was rigged, was set up to, to do just that. In other words, uh, he didn't have any scope for overinvestment in his, uh, in his uh, stories. Uh, but clearly, uh, what we can see, you have overinvestment, you are sort of stretching beyond uh, the PPF, but you also have malinvestment. Uh, and you have overconsumption this in both uh, diagrams. I could have called that malconsumption, but that sounds like malnutrition or something, so I called mal malconsumption. And if you check on Mises, you'll find that he uses the phrase, probably have it down here, Mises repeatedly uses the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption. Overconsumption because you're not getting enough interest for your money. Malinvestment because you're responding with too long a term capital with that uh, low interest rate. All right? So the tug of war that pits consumers against investors pushes the economy beyond the PPF. The low interest rate favors investment, and increasingly binding resource constraints keep the economy from reaching the extra PPF point. In other words, resources aren't, investment resources just aren't made available. And that comes to light eventually in some form or another. So if you look at the PPF, you can see uh, it starts moving beyond the PPF with an investment bias because of that low interest rate. And then when it runs up against resource constraints, a lot of investors realize that they can't finish their projects profitably. In fact, I owe to Friedman the terminology for that. He calls it, now let me think what he called it. He calls it desperation borrowing. He says that there seems to be some desperation borrowing there. In other words, this is business people who wish they hadn't started the project, but now that they've gotten into it, they're trying to cut their losses by borrowing even at high prices in order to finish their investment process. But they can't all borrow enough money to buy enough resources because there aren't the resources there, right? And so eventually the economy turns south, we get it turned south, and guess what? Keeps going. There is what Hayek calls, and he called this before Keynes ever wrote the general theory, a secondary deflation, a secondary depression. The, that once the, the whole economy is in disequilibrium because of this out-of-whack interest rate, uh, it goes into recession, and, and that can easily feed on itself, and it, it can spiral down into a deep depression. That's not to say that Hayek has turned Keynesian. No, no. This is just what hap can happen in the aftermath of the downturn, which was caused by the credit expansion. All right? And, and actually, what we can see is that when Keynes looked at the situation, all he saw was that long, downward-moving orange arrow 
Okay, that's all he saw. He says that's what has to be explained, and he and he explained it in terms of a collapse in animal spirits, loss of confidence, and there was a loss of confidence, but not just an irrational loss of confidence. It was a loss of confidence because the whole economy was discoordinated, which had been revealed by people trying to finish projects that they wish they hadn't started, okay? Okay, now here is the language of disequilibrium. You've got wedge between saving and investment. You've got tug of war between consumers and investor. You've got dueling triangles. I owe that terminology to John Cochran at Metropolitan State in Colorado. Uh, and again, you've got the connected diagrams. I haven't shown the labor diagrams because I need more than two here and don't have room for them. Get too messy. Okay, looks like that. Now, this is a summary diagram, and I'm going to apologize for putting out three P's here. It makes it more sound like a, a management lecture or worse, okay? But I'll succumb to it. Padding the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment, right? Papering over the difference between saving and investment gives play to a tug of war between consumers and investors. Pitting early stage against late stages distorts the Hayekian triangle in both directions, the temporal discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. That's the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Watch the economy respond to credit expansion. Now you're gonna see it all at once here, okay? <laughs> you didn't know that's what was going to happen. <laughs> now, how many can remember who this figure is? <laughs> that's Joe the plumber. In other words, he's just the innocent guy out there trying to make a living. You know, can't you guys, can't you guys get it straight? You know, the answer, of course, is no. We got just a couple of voices in the wilderness to say that the Austrians aren't totally neglected from The Economist, and this is clear back in 2002 when we were talking about dot-com instead of the housing bubble. Recognition of the Austrian business cycle theory is applied to the dot-com boom and bust comes from September 28th, and here's what they said. The recent business cycles in both America and Japan display many Austrian features, as indeed they do. They did. Landhoven, he's almost an honorary Austrian, okay? He has that Swedish name, I know, but pretty Austrian. Uh, so writing in 2008, okay, as well, here's what he says, operating an interest targeting regime. In other words, they're manipulating interest rates and keeping them low. Keying on the CPI, the Fed was lured into keeping rates far too low for too long. The result was inflation of asset prices. That's in the early stages, isn't it? Combined with a general deterioration of credit quality, a lot of desperation borrowing going on. This, of course, does not make a Keynesian story. It is rather a variation on the Austrian overinvestment theme. You should have said malinvestment, overinvestment, but uh, so he recognizes it that way. And the uh, variation had to do with the risk that was involved, and that's explained by you know Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Barney Frank. Uh, let's see one more, maybe. I don't know this guy. Anybody know this guy, Forsyth? Uh, showed up on uh, Fox Voices, and what, here he is. But the Austrian were were the ones who could see the seeds of collapse in the successive credit booms. It's, aided and abetted by the Fed policies, especially under former chairman Alan Greenspan. While he disavows, again, the responsibility for boom and bust most recently, gives the date and so on, uh, monetary policy played a key role in creating the successive bubbles and busts during his tenure from 87 to 06. And that's the story. Okay, thank you much. Right at 5 o'clock, please. Thank you.